Hello again YouTubers, um, I was in fact just about to go to bed and uh, that's something I've been thinking about for a while, quite a while and uh, I, I want to do a series of videos really on fossils, it's a little subject that uh, has fascinated me really over the last year say and I want to start, it's such a wide subject, let's be honest, massive subject, you can learn so much from it and you can't cover it in a 10 minute video. So I thought what I'd do is just start with something that, that I find really fascinating. Um, okay, it's this little guy. You can see him there. Hello. It's a, put it to the light a little bit more. You might get a better impression. Let's see how close I can get. It's a branchiosaur. A branchiosaur. You might say, well, it's, it's just more or less an imprint on, on, on a piece of limestone. But um, this branchiosaur is a very important fossil. Fascinating creature. Why? Why is this fascinating? Well, this is one of the very first backboned creatures to walk out onto um, land, basically. It's an early form of amphibian. Now... I might put this on the screen if I can. Um, I did take some film a bit earlier, but uh, you can probably just see some very small legs just here. And I say legs, they're more just sort of hands around this area here. Also has, oh, if I can get a bit closer, sorry about the face. Um, it's a very sort of curved nose, uh, mouth area, almost amphibian. There we go, was that slightly better? Um, as I say, I'll, I'll pop something up on this later so you can see it. And um, it lived in water. It, it wasn't really a land dweller, it was a water dweller. Certainly its ancestors and perhaps some of its own kind did go out onto land. They also show, so, show signs of uh, external gills. And uh, this particular specimen it actually has some uh, slight uh, uh, remnants of skin, which is quite rare. So, uh, and it's a large specimen. Most most uh, branchiosaurs are, are just this sort of size. So, uh, it, this is a good size adult. You can probably see the eyes as well, which were obviously well developed. And uh, up here, area. Anyway, the world well developed and. Um, as I say, this was one of the first creatures that went out onto land. It actually didn't grow legs to go out onto land. Um, its little feet that it actually developed would have been useful in the water itself, in shallows and on the, obviously in shallows on the shoreline, in both fresh and salt water. The order of, oh, I'll keep the camera, sorry. The order of this, um, the genetic order which this uh, species comes from, which is known as the Tem, uh, sorry, Temnospondii, okay, I knew I'd not say that in one go, Temnospondii, um, this order, um, it, was, uh, it was certainly around between 340 to 120 million years ago. So um, it, it did carry on for a very long time. So, and these creatures, as I say, lived in water. What happened was, some of them obviously went onto land um, and formed new species. The old species still remained, as we see in evolution all the time, and I notice uh, creationists bring this up an awful lot. Um, the fact that species seem exactly the same as uh, some of the fossils. Well, yes, they do, but uh, some of the subspecies went on to become new species themselves. And this is what happens in evolution all the time. Now, if you think uh, the most important thing, and let's put this into some perspective, the most important thing to remember about evolution is sex, um, which, is, which is fun. But uh, sex, why sex? Well, look at it this way. Let's, let's make it quite simple. You are a product 
of your mother and your father. Now, you're not a clone of your mother or a clone of your father. You're not identical, you're not exactly the same. You are either male or you are female. You're not half male, half female. You are male or you are female. What you have is a dominant gene that will make you male or female or whatever. Um, the whatevers, are, by the way, aren't, aren't very common, but, uh, but you, you're going to turn out one or the other. Now, you're going to inherit some of the points of your mother and some of the points of your father, but there is always a dominant gene amongst it, which it forgets. Well, it doesn't forget, it just sort of uh, doesn't exist in yourself. You are a new being. You are not. You are still human, obviously, but you are individual. You're an individual. You are not your mother. You are not your father. You will always be individual. And this is the way evolution works. There will always be a difference in the offspring. And uh, what you inherit from your parents could be good. And hopefully most of the time it is. But obviously sometimes you'll get the bad bits as well. And so you can blame them. Um, this is inevitable. This is um, part of natural selection. And natural selection is really as simple as that. It's, it's, it's not that complicated to ex when you only take it into that context. Obviously, over thousands, millions of generations, you're going to get vast changes. Each human, um, look at your neighbour, look at your wife, look at look at look at even another member of your family, and you will find that there will be around 120 different genetic mutations between yourself and uh, anyone else. This is uh, quite easy for us to see in humans. So uh, why can't you see it in all the other animals? Yeah, uh, if you look at one zebra, you might think the other zebra looks exactly the same, but um, there is a difference, and there always will be. If it's just temperament or way of life or the brain capacity, these will always be changes, and that is how evolution works. It's uh, it's it's quite simple, really, when you look at it. But what you have to do is look at it on a grand time scale by changing conditions. Those conditions are the thing that's going to make the big difference. Bear with me a second. Anyway, going back to uh, our little Branchiosaurus, there's uh, other things we do know about these species. We also know that what um, from the larval stages that uh, have been found in fossils, Certain ones, some of the species, did metamorphosize from a larval stage into its adult form. Whereas others actually seem to stay in their larval form, these early amphibians, and just grew into adulthood that way, much in the way that axolotls uh, do today. So, um, it was always like nature was experimenting at the time with different ways of evolving. And uh, it was very much survival of the fittest, I suppose, or to more accurately put it, natural selection that, that um, brought these animals into fruition. They did disappear, as I say, 120 million years ago. But in that time, there were many, many species. Some of them did grow into almost crocodile-like, uh, longer snouts, um, or wider snouts, more rounded snouts. We have, we have um, slightly more, as we see as time goes on, the limbs get thicker, the, ling the limbs get stronger, and uh, obviously go into, uh, the, when they start to form into reptiles, so from the amphibians. So um, we can trace these fossils in many different species going a long way. There is a lot of what many people would call missing links. They are in fact there, and very much so for these creatures. So uh, it's not just like you found one, so therefore that must be the case. That was the case 150 years ago perhaps, but now we have many thousands of these fossils to look at, and we can see small 
gradual differences between each one and uh, the dominant ones did go on to be um, obviously the ones that evolved um, so anyway that'll do for a start and I'll see what I can do later so for now peace